Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome to the Royal Windsor Racecourse for tonight's performance of War Horse. It's an adaptation of the novel by Michael Mapergo, and it's my pleasure to introduce you to Robert Powell, who will be voicing Joey. I was born here, in the depths of rural Devon, on a farm that was nowhere special. My mother was a working farm horse. I don't remember much of my early days, but I remember well enough the day of the horse sale. The terror of it stayed with me all my life. I was not six months old when my mother and I were taken to the auction. She was a good, strong horse and was sold within minutes, but I took longer to sell. When the hammer went down, my new owner led me away. He was old and smelled of drink. I didn't trust him. I was sad and missing my mother. When I got to the farm that was to become my home, I was hot and exhausted. It was there that I met Albert. Albert was the same height as me and talked so gently as he approached that I was immediately calm. He smoothed my back first and then my neck talking all the while about what a fine time we would have together, how I would grow up to be the smartest horse in the whole world, and how we would go hunting together. I shall call you Joey, he said. I think it suits you. That first day, Albert had promised to take care of me and protect me from his father, who sometimes got angry. He kept that promise to me. Nearly two years passed, during which time we became the very best of friends. One afternoon, after we had finished working in the fields, we heard bells ringing from the village. Albert's father came rushing up the lane and in his sober voice announced, It's war. I've just heard it in the village. It's certain for sure now. We'll teach them a thing or two. We'll teach them a lesson they'll never forget. Days later, Albert's father took me into the village. He was unusually gentle and kind. There were men in khaki uniforms everywhere and a military band playing a march. A captain came to meet us and spoke to Albert's father. You're right, farmer. He'd make a fine mount for any regiment. I wouldn't mind having him myself. Albert's father stroked my neck. You'll be all right, old son, he whispered. You won't understand and neither will Albert. But unless I sell you, I can't keep up with the mortgage and we'll lose the farm. It was then that I fully realized I was being abandoned, and I began to neigh. I was just about to give up hope when I saw my Albert running through the crowd. He pleaded with Captain Nichols to let him join the army with me, but the captain wouldn't let him. I'm sorry, young man, you have the spirit, but not the years. Albert made the captain promise to look after me, then he turned and went away through the crowd until I couldn't see him anymore.
In the few short weeks before I went off to war, I was to be changed from a working farm horse into a cavalry mount. It was only in the last week of my military education that I really began to settle into the work. I began to appreciate the good food and the grooming and began to think less and less of the farm, although Albert, his face and voice, stayed clear in my mind. On the day of the final maneuvers, we cantered so fast I was flying over the ground. The only horse that could keep up with me was a black stallion. I picked up that his name was Topthorn. There was a kindness in his eye that held no threat for me. We were stabled together that night, and again on the boat that was to carry us off to France and away to the war. Once in France, we marched out into the flat, open country. Every hour of the march brought us nearer to the distant thunder of the guns. At night, the horizon would be bright with orange flashes. All at once, the orders rang out. Forward, form squadron column, draw swords. I felt Captain Nichols' knees close right around me, and he loosened the reins. Easy, Joey, easy now. We'll come out of this all right, don't you worry. As the bugle sounded, we charged out of the shade of the wood and into the sunlight of battle. I heard the death rattle of a machine gun, and then quite suddenly I found that I had no rider. All I could do was continue to run with the rest of the squadron. Only a few horses reached the barbed wire defences. Some of the horses ran into the wire before they could be stopped and got stuck there. I saw Topthorn and his rider leap over and followed them through to find myself in amongst the enemy. We were surrounded by an entire company of soldiers, their rifles pointing up at us. Topthorn's rider dismounted. Don't you worry, you two, he said. The Germans love their horses just as much as we do. That was the last time we saw him. If it is possible to be happy in the middle of a nightmare, then Topthorne and I were happy that summer. The German soldiers did indeed value their horses, and we were well cared for. Every day we pulled a cart of wounded soldiers away from the battle to the field hospital. At night we were looked after by a kind farmer and his granddaughter, Emily. She loved us very much and made sure to be there to greet us every time we returned and wave us off every morning. We cherished the summer we spent with little Emily but during a war, your life can change in an instant. One morning, an artillery troop arrived at the farm with new orders for us. We were to haul heavy guns to where the army needed them. The guns were heavy, and food became scarce as the weather got cold. All the horses in the troop began to lose weight and condition. At the same time, the battle seemed to become more furious and prolonged. We worked harder and longer hours, pulling in front of the gun. We were always sore and cold. We were hauling our gun up a steep hillside when Topthorn began to stumble. His breathing became labored. Every step seemed to be more and more of an effort for him. As we reached the top of the bank, Topthorn sank to his knees. I waited for him to get up, but he did not. He lifted his head once towards me, as if to ask for help. 
than he was still. I knew instinctively that he was dead, and I had lost my best and dearest friend. The German soldiers with me bowed their heads. As we stood silent on the hillside, I heard the first whistle of a shell above us and saw the explosion as it landed in the woods. The soldiers cut me free from the gun and ran for cover. Not all of them made it. I was frozen in place. I could not leave my friend, for I knew once I did, I would be all alone in the world again. I don't think I would ever have left him if it had not been for the tank, a great grey lumbering beast that came towards me over the brow of the hill. Blind terror tore me from the top thorn side and sent me bolting into the valley. I do not know how long I blindly ran, trying to escape the mountains. came, I found myself surrounded by a thick mist. I could only see the vague shades of light and dark around me. As the mist began to clear, I found myself in no man's land. On either side of me, there were entrenched armies. I had been spotted by both armies, and men from both sides called out to me. Injured and in pain, I began to panic. Waving white flags, one man from either side came to comfort me. They spoke kindly to one another and decided that as the closest help for me was on the Allied side, that the British soldier should look after me. That is how I came to be in a British veterinary hospital, nursed back to health by a young man from Devon. How the devil did you get yourself stuck out there in no man's land, you old silly? Against all the odds, my Albert had come to rescue me. He didn't recognize me at first, even though I knew him. But after a good bath, he knew me as Joey. When the end of the war did come, it came swiftly, almost unexpectedly, it seemed, to the men around me. There was little joy, little celebration of victory, only a sense of profound relief that at last it was finished and done with. And so I came back from the war that Christmas time with my Albert riding me up into the village. And there to greet us was the silver band from Hatherley and the rapturous pealing of the church bells. We 
were both received like conquering heroes, but we both knew that there were heroes that had not come home, that they were lying out in France alongside Captain Nichols and Topthorne. We would always remember them. And as we commemorate the centenary of the outbreak of the First World War, let us remember all the brave soldiers and horses who gave their lives in order that we might enjoy ours.